In the previous video, we've started off by discussing quantization noise. If you haven't done so, watch it now, since we'll be making use of the concepts introduced, particularly quantization noise. You may also want to watch my video about sampling rate and bit depth before watching any of these videos about dithering, since the concept of bit depth is essential to understanding dithering. Dithering is simply the process of adding white random noise to a signal before we quantize it to a lower bit depth. This is done to make the quantization noise more random or white. So how does this work? First, an example. Let's quantize a 480 Hz pure sine wave using 4 bits of resolution. And let's start adding more and more white noise to it before quantizing. Watch and listen what happens to the quantization error as we increase the amount of white noise. I'd just like to stress what you're going to see. The left column shows the original unquantized sine wave, but with different levels of white noise added. The middle column shows how the quantized signal looks like with 4 bits of quantization. Of course, as we add more and more white noise, the resulting quantized signal looks more and more noisy. On the right column, you'll see the quantization noise, which is the difference between the original signal and the quantized signal. What you should note is that as more and more white noise is added to the signal before quantization, the quantization noise becomes whiter and whiter. Listen as I play each of the waveforms to you. The more white noise we add to the signal before lowering the bit depth, the wider the quantization noise. I'd like to stress that dithering does not get rid of quantization noise. It merely gives it a more random, less obtrusive nature. Returning to the image processing analogy from the previous video, here is the original cat image, the downsampled image to 8 bits, and now the downsampled image, but with noise added before downsampling. In other words, with dithering. The resulting dithered and downsampled image looks a lot better than the one without any dithering prior to downsampling. This particular dither is called a Floyd Steinberg dither and is slightly more advanced than what we've discussed so far. It's not entirely white, but the basic idea is still the same. So far, we've looked at very extreme examples. Where does dithering occur in the real world? Modern recording equipment can record audio at 24 bits, but audio CDs can only support 16 bits of audio. Hence, before downsampling the recorded and mixed audio to CD, one usually dithers it by adding random noise. This makes sure that the quantization error introduced by going from 24 down to 16 bits is random and non-obtrusive. How important this is will depend on the dynamic range of your material. Classical music, which has many quiet passages, is an ideal candidate. Remember, quantization noise affects the least significant bit, so it's usually small. A 16-bit CD has about 2 to the 16, that is 65,000, more or less, levels of detail. And quantization noise, if it exists, is only going to be about 1 over 65,000 of the maximal level of detail. 
For it to be noticed, it has to be on the order of, or not much weaker, than the other audio material being played. So classical music's quiet passages are susceptible to quantization noise. On the other hand, quantization noise will get drowned out uh, with your favorite pop band's latest super compressed CD that has no dynamic range. Think about it. Who cares what happens in the least significant bit when you have a huge wall of guitars super compressed drums and loud vocals all going at once. So, to dither or not to dither? Dither, of course, it's for free. But the truth is, it's a very small effect, one that will probably not get noticed without a quiet, controlled listening environment and a trained pair of ears. Unfortunately, YouTube's sound compression prohibits any meaningful audio comparison because the effects of dithering and quantization noise in real-life situations going from, say, 24 to 16-bit of audio are so small. If you run into a video which does present such a comparison, be very suspicious of its usefulness or truthfulness. I'm going to give you the best advice anyone can. Experiment. Export the same tract with and without dithering and ask a friend to blind test you you will soon reach a conclusion based on your own experience, ears, and artistic convictions. Dithering requires that we add some random noise to our signal before downsampling. This noise should have a flat spectrum. In other words, be white. However, there is more than one way to generate white random noise. Probably the easiest and most efficient way is to use what's known as a triangular probability distribution function, or TPBF for short. You might have seen these initials in your dithering plugin. This is an excellent way to efficiently dither. Although we won't discuss the heavy mathematical theory of dithering in this video, I'll just mention that TPBF, white noise, decouples the first and second moments of the quantization noise. This is something that's highly desirable. Another option consists of using noise with a non-flat spectrum. For example, you might add noise that has more high-frequency components, such as blue noise. Let's compare it to white noise. This is referred to as shaped noise, shaped noise dithering or colored dithering. What this tries to do is force the dithered quantization noise to occupy higher frequencies that are outside the human audio range. This makes the dithered quantization noise less audible. Once again, personal experimentation is key to deciding whether you want to use colored dithering or not, but this is truly a very fine point. You will be fine if you just stick to TPBF. However, a word of caution. Only apply colored dithering at the final stage of your processing. If you need to dither audio at some point during mixing, use TPBF. This is because subsequent processing of your audio can cause the colored noise from the high frequencies to creep into the audible listening range and create nasty artifacts. So. Use TPBF at all stages before the final mix and use either TPBF or colored dithering during the final mix down. Is dithering the same as noise shaping? No. Dithering and noise shaping are not the same. Noise shaping is often applied in conjunction with dithering, but it is a completely different topic. Don't confuse shaped dither, which we've just discussed, with noise shaping. In dithering, we add random noise to the signal before quantizing it. In noise shaping, the quantization error is fed back into the input of the quantizer. This is equivalent in signal processing to applying a filter that acts on the noise, changing its spectral characteristics essentially moving the spectral content of the noise to a frequency band to which our ears are less sensitive. This is not the same as colored dither. I might get into that in a 
different video. For now, just know that some audio engineers like using noise shaping, some don't. As with all things dither related, this is a very personal uh, decision and I highly suggest you experiment with this and find out whether you like noise shaping or not. And once again, sticking to TPBF, regular white dither will usually cover 99% of all situations. This concludes my two-part series about dithering. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope to see you in the next video.